Welcome again to The Living Word and to a fascinating peep at one of the greatest achievements of modern times, a project in which a continent was penetrated by an ocean. As well as a vivid documentary, there is also stirring music. And you're going to hear some of it now, the Salvation Army Band playing a new arrangement of a joyful gospel song. Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. are attracted by water, especially flowing water, and particularly if it is swift and deep. It calls to something instinctive in our being. We all understand what is meant by passing through deep waters, and when one of the writers of the Bible attempts to describe the voice of God and says that it is as the sound of many waters, we hear it in some inner ear, and we know what he meant. I say this because in this episode of The Living Word, we are going to join ourselves to those who do business in great waters. In fact, I want to show you one of the mightiest businesses ever done by man with great waters. Halfway across the continent of North America, there stretches a great waterway formed by the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. In this water system, the waters travel for 1,200 miles in the river alone. This is the distance from Lake Ontario to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The first European to sail upon these waters was the great French explorer Jacques Cartier. In 1535, he sailed up the river until his vessels were stopped by the rapids which he named La Chine because he thought he was on his way to China. How far he really was from China, Cartier never guessed. Nor did he know what islands, rapids and falls lay just ahead of him. Cartier was forced to turn homeward, but others who followed him struggled farther up this river and saw the difficulties to be overcome. The portage was the usual answer to such obstacles, but even three centuries ago, one Frenchman, Dolier de Casson, soldier, engineer, and priest, actually began work on a canal one and a half feet deep to bypass the Lachine Rapids. The Iroquois Indians saw to it that his work was never completed. But this man's daring was the spark which ignited a long chain of events. You know now, of course, that I am speaking of the St. Lawrence Seaway and Power Project, which for five years kept thousands of men, both Canadian and American, occupied in doing business with great waters. The Long Sioux Rapids was one of the difficulties, and the first men were the survey crews who found the answers to the questions which engineers must know. Surveys ashore were not enough, and the secrets of the river were attacked from the air. Hovering overhead in a helicopter, Men computed the depth of the river by lowering a weight into the rushing waters below. And from this information, maps and models of the terrain were constructed. As a wind tunnel serves the air engineers in designing a plane, so this model of the Long Sioux Rapids and this model of the riverbed itself enabled the engineers to construct the great dams and dig their channels. Typical of the work carried on is that in the vicinity of the town of Iroquois, where two coffer dams were built, the one above and the other below the site of the proposed dam. 
These coffer dams are great temporary dams built to enable foundations to be laid or other construction operations to be undertaken on a site which is normally underwater. The Iroquois Dam is located in a bend of the river. The south half was built on the shore, and then the entire original shoreline was removed and the half on the north shore was constructed. It must be remembered that a tremendous hydroelectric power project was undertaken along with the shipping development. The coffer dam at the powerhouse site was constructed of adjacent cells whose continuous outside walls are strong enough to withstand the tremendous outside pressure from the water rushing past. This one consists of 60 cells, each one 65 feet in diameter. The entire coffer dam was 4,500 feet long. Here we see the anchoring of the cells by sections in the riverbed. Each cell is then filled with earth and rock so that it will withstand the pressure upon it. When the water is pumped out of the area, the riverbed is dry, as you see, so that trucks and men can work on dry land where once the river flowed. For 35 miles from the town of Cornwall to that of Iroquois, the river's flow was thus deflected from its normal channel. The waters rising in a head pond would result in the covering of 20,000 acres of land on the Canadian side of the river. Along the shore, great dikes of clay were erected to contain the water. The whole undertaking requiring the cooperation of many activities if mishap and disaster were to be avoided. This raising of river levels meant that town sites which had existed for centuries were now to be underwater. And in addition to all other activities, a tremendous house moving project was carried out. This mass moving job, one of the largest ever recorded, involved the moving or rebuilding of whole towns. Many of these people in the new towns took their old buildings with them, as it were, but many did not. Compare the perfection of the town planning of the new Iroquois with the personality and atmosphere possessed by the ancient villages as they had grown up along the river, when it was the highway for the early settlers in the country. In all, 6,500 people were moved. 16 miles of new roads were built and lighted. 40 miles of double-track railway were built. New stations with modern picture-windowed waiting rooms were constructed. The historic Highway No. 2 was rerouted for 35 of its miles, now cutting across the wide and fertile fields instead of winding tortuously beside the river. Today it passes the new communities, where people are completely reinstalled with everything provided for them. In many cases, they are much better situated than before. Central heating systems and new plumbing fixtures were installed. The houses painted and the grounds landscaped. New churches and schools have been built, though some historic churches were removed to the new location, as, for instance, this church. Modern shopping centers and business sections replaced the village store. So the work which had begun in 1954, after over two years of work, began to show signs of progress. By the end of 1956, Cement had been poured into dams at the rate of 4,000 tons a day, even in below zero weather. The closing of the gap in the Long Sioux Dam seems to symbolize the approaching mastery of the river. Feverish activity prevailed as tons of rock poured into the river at this point. Slowly the rapids began to disappear. Dredges bit and gouged at the earth to divert the flow of water. Another copper dam was erected to seal it off, until at last the riverbed was dry and the long Sioux Rapids, which had sung their songs of swiftness for long ages past, were silent at the hand of man. Silent they shall remain, but not dry. For nearly two years, the riverbed lay exposed, suffering the ravages of construction, the installation of turbines and generators for the power station rising there. Then came the restitution. Thirty tons of explosives were loaded at the point where the river control center stood. On July 1st, 1958, the countdown took place. The coffer dam was broken, and angry at their long displacement, the waters rushed into their place again. At long last, the dreams of many men are to be fulfilled. A passageway for ships into the heart of a continent is a reality. With a minimum depth of 27 feet, it reaches from Montreal to bring ships of all nations to seaports. Yes, seaports now, in Minnesota, Illinois, and Ohio. Small boys on the docks in Indiana may now talk to sailors on their ships from Tokyo and Singapore. Men, by the good mercy of God, have done great business with great waters. Where rapids had sung an intermittent melody, the whole seaway moves now like a sea fugue writ from east to west. This seaway, stretching far from view, recalls the words of John Keats. 
the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round Earth's human shores. For in its beauty and its power, the waters of this pathway speak of the purity and greatness of God. The psalmist said, They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. Now the sea has been brought to us. Now, too, the love of God has been brought to us in Jesus Christ. For all of us, too, the healing waters flow. and love are in that healing fountain, all I require to cleanse me and restore. Will you, right now, permit God's love to cleanse and restore your life to its purity and beauty? Pray, will you, that his grace may flow through your soul, redeem its desert places, and make a garden there. If you have been in deep waters, you shall see his wonders in these depths and you shall rise to life anew. Now, let us pray. O God, our Father, come to all of our hearts. May thy pardon and thy power sweep away our sin and flood our lives with thy presence, thy joy, thy love. May the blessing that transforms the life be upon us all just now and always. This we pray in and through the name of Jesus Christ, thy Son and our Savior. Amen. Be sure to join us again when we will seek to learn more of the living word and of him who is, in very truth, the living word. Mm -hmm.